And Norman Siegel, as you all know, is one of America's preeminent civil rights attorneys, who is executive director of the New York Civil Liberties Union for a number of years. And enough, enough. That's enough, enough. No, I'm just getting started. Oh my. I said enough. But uh, he's been very active with the issue of homelessness. And Norman will then uh, introduce those on the panel today and, uh, and, and lead the discussion. So uh, for any more interest in who we are as ethical culture, look at the, uh, the little palm card that we have here. It gives you a little bit of an idea and also gives you an opportunity to check out the website to learn more about us. So we hope to see you here often. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I want to welcome everybody. It's a really good audience. And this is a very important subject and especially very timely, not only in the last few months, but even today, because there was a hearing in the court about the right to shelter. And on we have the person who created the right to shelter, who's sitting to my right, uh, Bob Hayes, sitting next to him. Yeah, I'll give him a round of applause. Uh, he was a young lawyer in 1979, graduated from NYU Law School, and decided to go and use the New York State Constitution, Article 17, Section 1, which says that the state of New York commits an affirmative obligation, affirmative obligation to provide aid, care to the needy. And that's Bob saw it and went into court to argue that, therefore, there's a right to shelter. We'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, it got somewhat distorted the last few months. People don't even look back at the 1979 decision to see what the judge very creatively did. Uh, it's very frustrating because then when people, even the ex-president of the United States, Bill Clinton, goes on a radio show on Sunday, I'm sure he never read the decision and starts being critical of the right to shelter. So uh, if Bill Clinton is listening, you're dead wrong with what you were saying, and you keep your mouth shut until you finally find out what the law was back in 1979. Call Robert Hayes. He'll give you a quick 101 on the right to shelter. Uh, to my left is Tadia Toussaint, a brilliant young documentarian who made a terrific documentary about homelessness in New York. Uh, she'll tell you about who she is why she did the documentary, uh, hopefully what she learned. And each one of the panelists, the last one, Sherman Jackson. Sherman is someone I've known for a long time, a social justice activist. He worked for the Daily News as a reporter. He's worked in the federal government, the local government. And a couple of years ago, Sherman, who lived on the upper side, uh, ran into a streak of uh, bad luck and wound up homeless. And his experience being homeless for almost a year is something that we want you to hear from him about what that experience was firsthand and more important also what his recommendations are. We want to be very specific uh, to try to inform and to articulate how we can get out of this mess and more realistically, let me frame it, uh, how we can ameliorate this mess. I don't think after 40 years of bad, bad decisions by every mayor that we've ever had, uh, including my good friend, long-term current Eric Adams, who's making some wrong judgments about how to handle the right to shelter. Uh, I continue to tell him that, but it's sometimes like, you know, talking to the wall. So in the context, Mr. Mayor, if you're listening, <laughs> you're wrong on the right to shelter. Anyway, uh, we suggested that what we would do, and we're already 12 after 7, uh, each one of us will speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, I'm going to open up and trying to give a brief history of homelessness in New York over the last half century, uh, try to do that in 10 minutes, is a challenge in and of itself. 
Bob will follow, uh, talking about a case called Callahan versus Carey. Carey was the governor at that point, and our current governor says that the state was not party to the lawsuit, but the governor was the lead defendant. How can the state not be part of that lawsuit? So, Governor Haku, you should read these cases as well, or at least read the, the beginning of the case to understand that the former governor was a defendant in the case. And yes, New York State is a defendant in this case. Uh, we're then going to have uh, Tadia talk about her documentary. Uh, there's a trailer for two minutes. Uh, the trailer is pretty good, but the 48 minute? 19. 40, what? 19. The, the documentary yeah. itself. Mm -hmm. 20, 19, 19 minutes? Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. I have seen it. I thought it was much longer. But uh, the 19 <laughs> minutes uh, is well worth it, and hope it she'll give you the link so you can get to it. And then we'll have Sherman uh, talk about uh, who he is, the experience that he had, uh, to try to give you the first hand. And then, as the lawyer in me will do, I'll do closing statement. Uh, whatever holes we left, we'd like to finish this part of the panel by 9 o'clock, uh, not by 8 o'clock, so that we have a full hour or something like that uh, for this audience. Uh, I've done this once before uh, back in May, uh, and uh, the audience is sophisticated. It's not uh, shy to get up and say uh, to any of us, including myself, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, we ask everyone to do it in a courteous, respectful manner, if possible. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, please do. And uh, also, we also have uh, one aspect, which is the Street Homeless Advocacy Project. And I'm looking around now, and some of our SHAP volunteers are here. And I would ask each one of them to stand now so that you can let people know who you are. Uh, there's Gavin and Rochelle and Rachel and Laura. So we've got four. And Sherman's a volunteer, and Bob and I. So. And finally, uh, Sandra, can you stand for a second? I don't want to embarrass you, but Sandra Stein, could you stand? This is, this is the individual from Ethical who's very creative and very caring about issues of public concern. She's put the First Amendment one together in May. She put this one together. Give her a round of applause, please. Well, thank you. It's, everything is always a team effort. Uh, as I get older, you can't do it alone. And also, even if you could do it alone, it's not as much fun as doing it with other people. Uh, but you really, especially these days, where the whole country is upside down uh, and chaos reigns, we have a leaderless House of Representatives as of tonight. Uh, and how did this ever happen? But whatever happened, the way I think to uh, get it back on track is teamwork. That everybody should not think just because you believe one through seven, that every one of those seven things you can't give a little on with other people who don't agree with one of those seven things. Uh, coalitions are essential. Uh, dialogue is essential. We can agree to disagree. It would be boring if we agreed on everything, but Agreeing to disagree is a principle. So let me get to my 10 minutes. Uh, we start with no New Yorker. No New Yorker should have to live on the streets. In fact, most individuals, if you stop and begin a conversation with them, first of all, they're going to start talking a mile a minute because very often most New Yorkers just ignore them. They're invisible. So if you stop and talk, we prefer to tell people, uh, is it okay if we have a conversation with you? If they tell you to go get lost, get lost. But if you begin in that way, our experience is they begin to open up uh, and they start going a mile a minute. Now, some of the time when we do our outreach, uh, I can confess, I don't know what the heck the person is saying. 
because it's all disconnected. Uh, and I look for a little thread that I can pull on to continue the conversation. And sometimes you can't really get very far in the conversation on a first time. That's why at CHAP, we go every Thursday night, seven to nine, with the same team, usually half a dozen people, to the same location so that people begin to know who we are, we get to know they are, who they are, and we begin to develop trust. Trust is very important. And then maybe we can get the people off the streets. In our first year, 535 interactions. Of those 535 interactions, 109, 198 individuals left the streets. Now, that doesn't mean that when they go to places that they stay there or get into permanent housing or jobs or mental health programs because it's a revolving door as well. They come out because the facilities that exist today uh, are not adequate. So that's another challenge to try to improve the existing uh, places. The idea that the people out on the street are monolithic is just not accurate. Uh, and the things that are needed is what we call viable options. What a viable option is, ideally, is a single room somewhere. Uh, the old SROs that I'll talk about in a second were ideal. Unfortunately, we ripped so many of them down, especially on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Uh, it wasn't only economic issues, it had racial issues as well that I'll get to in a minute. But in the context of all that, uh, we need what's called safe havens, uh, stabilization beds, where people are placed who have mental health problems, have drug problems, sometimes they overlap, and they get support services. We also think that there are significant 10, 15 percent at a minimum people out on the street who are employable, that with some job training and job placement, uh, they can get back on their feet. We have lots of instances where that is successful, but all those viable options that I talked about, including the single rooms, they don't exist. When we get our data, our data uh, from the city of New York on Thursday at around five o'clock, sometimes when we have four or five teams of 25 people out there, we get a handful of single rooms citywide. So we don't really have that much to offer people uh, that would be inviting. If we had a lot of single room options, uh, we would be doing much, much better than we are now. Although our approach is, city's approach we read was something 7% uh, success rate. Ours is usually about a third. We're able to get about one out of every three people because of the approach that we talk about. Very often when I'm out there, the first thing someone will say to me, uh, do you work for the city? I go, no. They said, are you getting paid to do this? I said, no. And then they begin to open up. That's why we do volunteer work. We don't want any public money uh, because one, we don't want to deal with all the paperwork. Uh, we only want to do it the two hours that we're out there every Thursday night to try to ameliorate this problem. And finally, we found that that approach is much better because when people hear and they give us the softball and they say, so why are you doing this? And then we talk about, well, we're a New Yorker. You're a New Yorker. Uh, we live in neighborhoods similar to where you are, and we care. When we say we care, they begin to lighten up and begin to respond to us in an affirmative way. It's not so difficult. And uh, the motto was, uh, I was a young law student even before Bob was a young law student. Uh, I went to NYU as well. And in the summer of 1966, program called the Law Student Civil Rights Coalition uh, sent about 70 of us to various southern jurisdictions. I was sent to Edwards, Mississippi to get trained uh, with regard to the southern civil rights movement. Yes, Roger was there in 65 uh, doing medical stuff. Uh, and it changed my life. Uh, and it was all about race. And you know, as I look back during that period with SNCC SCLC, uh, CORE, the NAA, uh, they really did change the South. 
and the Southern Civil Rights Movement was successful. I'm reading a wonderful book by Jonathan Eig, E I G, called King. I st strongly recommend it. It's just a terrific book about that whole period and also focuses on Dr. King. Uh, sui generis, Dr. King. There was no one like him, no one uh, since. Uh, he was assassinated on April 4th, 1968, and that's part of the reasons why we haven't really moved very far on the race issue. But what happened in 66, at least for me, there were lots of people from all over the country trying to address segregation and racism. And we thought, people at the Civil Liberties Union, myself, why don't we do a similar kind of thing around economic issues. And that's the origin of the Street Homeless Advocacy Project. That if we could attract uh, people, students, I'll get to that in a second, uh, regular folks, uh, retirees, to come out on Thursday nights, seven to nine, ideally in their neighborhoods. That's even better. If you live on, I live on 72nd on the west side. Uh, you know, I do South Ferry, but if we had a team on the Upper West Side, like from 60, where we are now, to let's say 86, it would be ideal, because then when you're talking to someone, you could actually say, I'm a neighbor, and we want to try to help you. And that concept we're trying to develop. On the students, we were able to make a presentation to the chancellor of the City University of New York. I'm a graduate of Brooklyn College, proud graduate of that school. And we now have a team set up at Brooklyn College the College of Staten Island at Hostess in uh, the Bronx. And Rachel and Laura are going to be team leaders at uh, uh, Hunter College on the Upper East Side. And if that program works, CUNY has said to us that next year they'll give us access to all of their uh, campuses around the city so we really could have a statewide uh, presence. But we don't just want students, we want everybody. The more people we have, the more successful we'll be able to get people off the streets and become advocates to the government to get them to change some of their cockamamie policies with regard to shelter and things of that sort. Uh, so in the context of homelessness uh, in the 50s and 60s, and Bob will talk about the homeless on the Bowery, alcoholics, uh, some drug, but basically alcoholics. Uh, when we went into the 60s and 70s, if anyone has ever read Ken Kesey's book or saw the film, One f uh, Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, you got to understand why we adopted the institutionalization. But then uh, there were lots of questions about what does uh, imminent danger to oneself or others mean? Uh, the city government and the state government in the last decade or so has tried to water down that standard. So no more imminent danger. Now it's actually if you can't provide uh, the essence of life, uh, food, clothing, shelter, therefore you can be picked up involuntarily. A lot of controversy about uh, even within the social justice community. Some people are in favor of that. Some people are opposed to that. I'll just read a short a uh, quote from the U.S. Supreme Court in a case called O'Connor versus Donaldson, 1975. In short, a state cannot constitutionally confine, confine without more, without more, a non-dangerous individual who's capable of surviving safely in freedom by himself or with the help of willing and responsible family members or friends, resoundingly rejecting the argument that a state may involuntarily commit the mentally ill for aesthetic reasons, the Supreme Court said, may the state fence in harmless, mentally ill solely to save its citizens from exposure to those whose ways are different. One might ask if the state to avoid public unease could incarcer incarcerate all who are physically unattractive or socially eccentric. Mere public intolerance or animosity cannot constitutionally justify the deprivation of a person's physical liberty. Uh, curtailment of uh, your liberty is a very serious constitutional issue. In the 70s and 80s, uh, many people in New York City, especially Manhattan, 
lived in what was called single room occupancy hotels. The number of available SROs decreased material from the early 1970s through the mid-1980s due to gentrification and redevelopment. During this time period, New York City, mostly Manhattan, lost approximately 100,000 SRO units. As the city did not adequately plan for alternative low-income housing, many of the displaced became homeless. In the early 1980s, a significant percentage of all single adult shelter residents in New York City listed an SRO as their last residence. Uh, Sarah Lee Evans, who's sitting here, who's my wife, ran the West Side SRO Law Project with got at Riverside. If anyone wants to talk about that whole era and how uh, they threw people out uh, and the kind of abusive uh, tactics that owners of buildings did, uh, she's an expert on that. One thing I wanted to add on this point is that many consider the displacement caused by urban re redevelopment no more than a harsh economic reality. But the reality is, back then and even right now, there's an enormous racial component to this. Uh, in 1983, when I had access to all this data, approximately 90% of the sheltered homeless families statewide were persons of color. New York City, 97%. Approximately 70% of the sheltered homeless single adults were persons of color, approximately 80 cents in 80% in New York City. It hasn't changed. Uh, most of the people out on the streets that we deal with are men, although there are women, and uh, they're black men or dark-skinned Latinos. And they're not 20 years old. A lot of our people that we work with, they're in their 50s and 60s, uh, and they've just run a streak of bad luck, God bless you. Uh, and in the context of that, again, understanding who is out on the streets is very important, especially if you want to try to come up with a plan to ameliorate the numbers of people out on the streets. Uh, so what SHAP has done is been able to get out there uh, to begin to talk with people that are out on the street to try to create some hope. Uh, I tell one instance where we got a guy into the Brooklyn Welcome Center on uh, Fort Hamilton Parkway on 36th Street in the Borough Park section of Brooklyn. The next week when we went to the Staten Island Ferry on the Manhattan side, there was a guy that was waiting for us. Uh, that was the first time we had people waiting for us. And I said to him, so what's this about? He said, you're the guy who helped my a uh, friend, red-headed guy, John, whatever. I said, yeah. Well, he told me about you guys. Can you help me? Uh, and uh, I said, sure. He said, could you get me in the same place as John? I said, we'll try, and we did. Uh, we've had people uh, that we were able to help, uh, and then I got an email in the beginning of September where a guy that we helped, 62-year-old black guy, uh, and I won't mention his name, uh, and he was so elated, he found in Brooklyn, through our assistance, a permanent single room, and his whole outlook had changed, and he was so positive about life now, 62-year-old guy. So these are stories, and I say to people who might be interested in working with us, no matter what happens during my week, when I'm in court or dealing on cases. Sometimes you win, but it's all abstract. You don't know whether it's gonna make a difference in anyone's life. If I'm, every Thursday night, be able to get at least one person off the streets, it's real. I come home feeling, not only did I accomplish something, but exhilarated and inspired that if we had, especially in New York, it's like juries rather than judges, the people in New York, by and large, are really good. And if you convince people that we're serious about this, we've thought it through, Thursday night, 7 to 9, why? Because you're a volunteer. We can't ask you for more. We don't expect you to be there every Thursday night. But if you can come every possibly two, three Thursday nights in a month, we want to have you. And we can train you, and you can get out there, and you'll feel good about helping people. So. I've gone probably more than I should. 
uh, and I'll turn it over to my good friend, uh, Bob Hayes. Okay, thanks, Norman. Um, so, I've known my dear friend, um, Norman, for many, many, many years. <clears throat> and basically, our um, deal is that I'm expected to say twice as much as he does in half the time. <laughs> so, wish me luck on this. Um, my assignment has been to kind of, you know, lay out for you all the uh, fundamentals of how the right to shelter was initially recognized um, in, in, by the New York courts and some of the you know, fracases and battles that we had. Now I'm a little nervous, because <laughs> I have to say um, to your left, my right, is the eminent uh, attorney, uh, Doran Gopstein, who back in the 80s was the first deputy corporation counsel. And he scared the hell out of me, because I was like you know, 18 years old basically doing these cases. And whenever the city realized they were like, if I went on a winning streak, they'd bring him in. It was like Mariana Rivera coming in to try to save the day. And um, he did sometimes to my dismay. So you'll keep me honest as I give this history, Doran, okay? Um, I can't not say that it's incredibly, I don't know how many folks here are really are members or you know, regulars at the uh, Ethical Culture Society, but you know, this litigation I'm about to describe kind of preceded the formation of the Coalition for the Homeless, the organization that ultimately kind of led the battles. Um, but not only were we calling ourselves the Coalition for the Homeless, we as an organization were homeless. And the only place that would let us do meetings of this kind, which was the beginning of the organization of this cause, was the Ethical Cultural Society. So I think it's in, I mean, thank you. Um, I, I think it's probably, you know, we finally, you know, got a broom closet at the Community Service Society and we, you know, we, um, but it's kind of touching for me because I think it's been probably since the 1980s since I've been in this building and this is where it started, so. Um, and I haven't seen the movie, but if you read the biography, the movie's based on, on Oppenheimer, uh, the, the tradition of ethical culture and his uh, upbringing is incredibly valuable. So anyway, I'm glad to be here. Okay, my job. The, uh, the right to shelter. Um, I think it's fair to say, um, I was just out of law school, so late 1970s. Um, I didn't really understand this at the time, but New York City was just emerging from its closest with bankruptcy. Um, and I think it's fair to say that everyone was still tightening their belts and retrenching. Um, I very naively stumbled into homeless folks, kind of like what Norman just talked about uh, in terms of how you get to understand what's going on. I had been a journalist briefly before law school, and it was talking to people. Um, I think probably some folks in this audience you know, were around back then and can remember that there really was an ethos in the city that homelessness was something that was like a lifestyle choice. You know, we'd had the New Deal, we'd had the Great Society. Uh, there were program people that, you know, they shouldn't be on the street, and they must have been on the street because they wanted to. Um, I mean, Doran even mentioned tonight that the word homeless was not in vogue uh, at this point in, in, in U.S. and New York history. The New York Times had their category under the word derelict. Um, when we went in court to argue the first round of the Callahan case, our friends at the New York Post, you know, headlined, bums in court. Seriously, and that was where it was coming from. Um, so, you know, at that point, um, yeah, the folks in city government didn't really know what was going on. Um, I learned a lot just by doing what lawyers should do and what journalists have to do, which is listen to people who know what the hell's going on. And you know, I picked up some friends who were working in a very small, quiet way um, with the uh, folks who are homeless at that point in the city. I, you know, maybe I'm part of this myself now. You know, I, I work with Dr. Platt here uh, on a, you know, a fairly large federally qualified health center. We have health centers around the city. Back then, you know, what we derisively called a charitable industrial complex, kind of were ignoring the problem. You know, Sarah Lee was out there trying to avoid homelessness and prevent homelessness by fighting SRO evictions, but, you know, the big charities uh, were not there. And there was no funding, there was no uh, public attention. So, even now I'll say that the last resort in getting public policy change probably should be the courts. Um, 
especially these days when you see what the courts are doing in the opposite direction uh, in terms of human needs. But we did talk to folks in the city government, not Mr. Gopstein, we never got that high, but there was zero interest um, on the part of city officials, which I understand now, they had no money. They didn't want to do anything to uh, um, support homeless people. Should I just go without this? No, no, no. Better? Better with it? Okay, 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 <clears throat> okay. Um, there's very little interest in helping, so we wound up going, you know, to the law library, and as Norman said, the state constitution uh, does say the aid, care, and support of the needy is a public obligation. And there were, you know, some city charter statements, but that was basically the fundamental argument, um, that whatever that constitutional provision meant, it meant that there uh, should be a roof over people's head, aid, care, support. Um, and, you know, I like to think I was a brilliant lawyer, but fundamentally the argument was, what can it mean if not a roof over your head? And then, Your Honor, the word shall means shall. And that was pretty much the argument. Um, you know, we added pages to the uh, legal briefs, but that was the argument. Um, a court bought it in the first round, and um, there was what's called a preliminary injunction that at that point wound up with an order saying homeless men, homeless men shall be provided shelter. It was a good feel uh, in this wild New York courtroom scene with like 50 other motions, 60 motions that were being argued the same day back then. <laughs> when the judge asked me, well, Mr. Hayes, why only men? I kind of explained because that was the issue. But the fact that he cared enough, that judge, to ask that question made me think we were doing okay. Um, we did okay. A couple of years, so we immediately began fighting to get some additional shelters open under that preliminary injunction. Went to trial. You know, preliminary injunction lawyers means the thing you do asking a court to help while the time for the case goes on. And we basically said, folks are gonna die on the streets this winter, Your Honor. If we don't do something now, we can't wait for the end of the case. The judge bought it. Um, 1981, we're in trial. Uh, in the midst of several weeks of trial, the um, court stood up and acknowledged on the record his gratitude for some of our witnesses who are working with homeless people. I don't know, I'd like to hear if you were involved in this decision, but during that lunch break, the city and state came back and said, maybe we should negotiate. And that led, after four or five months, to a consent decree, which is now the subject of ongoing litigation. God help us, 40 years later. Um, I'll skip over you know, the, the battles, but every fall for the next two or three or four or five years, we had to go back in court and ask the courts to enforce the right to shelter because, as one judge said, you know, this is serious. It wasn't a joke. You guys signed this. You have to be committed to it. Um, this court order was not written in blood, maybe, the judge wrote, but neither was it written in water. Um, and, you know, shelters opened, shelters opened, and it was a political battle. It got uh, more and more heated. Um, two more quick comments about litigation and shelters. Um, again, this was kind of inconceivable to me because obviously Ed Koch, the mayor then, had something of a progressive background. Um, but we had to re-litigate the right to shelter for women. And then I and legal aid had to redo it for families. And <laughs> the cases got easier because we had equal protection and things like that that made um, it kind of ridiculous that we had to keep uh, re-litigating that. There were complications, but the key thing I gotta, say, I gotta say is shelter was never seen as a solution to homelessness. Wasn't then is it now? Um, you know, Norman alluded to things called supported housing for people who need something more than just housing to keep it together. Support within housing is customized to people's needs, but many, many, many people homeless today uh, in the shelters, especially the new uh, migrant surge of homeless people, they just need affordable housing and jobs, and they'll do fine. Um, we continued, we persisted to bring litigation around the rights of people with mental illness for supported housing. Um, you know, we went upstream to some of the causes of homelessness in the litigation era. But at that point, you know, we did feel that even though the right to shelter was abysmally inadequate, it kept people alive. So often I look back at this work and think, you know, we failed because we didn't solve homelessness at all. You know, we used to dread 
um, years talking to student groups who kind of accepted homelessness as, you know, the usual state of New York life. Because it wasn't. It doesn't have to be. But it is now. Um, the battle for shelter right now is disappointing to me simply because it's a bare minimum. It really is a bare minimum. The larger battle has to be around housing, 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 which is the three-word solution. So with that, Norman, I did it in 11 minutes. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Now we'll turn to Tadia. So Tadia, tell us who you are and why did you decide to do this documentary? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me to the panel, Norman. Um, so just to give some context, uh, I am a producer and um, journalist at Brick TV. Uh, Brick TV is based uh, it, at Brick, which is in downtown Brooklyn. And we are really committed to telling social justice stories. And so we covered housing and security for a whole year. And all of our programming was really centered around that. And I'm part of the docs team. And my doc, which is called Broken Housing, it's out on YouTube. Um, and I'll make sure to share that so we can get it out to all the folks in the room. Um, when I first pitched the story idea, my intent was to make kind of like a primer. Um, folks who are not in the housing world, folks who are not you know, knowledgeable about the doings and the, the thing happening in the space. I really wanted to um, educate them on, there's so much, it's so complex when we get into this conversation around housing. And for me at the time, it was really new for me. And so um, one of my personal goals was that anybody who would watch the documentary would walk away with this knowledge about the complexities as to why this problem exists. And so the way that I did it, initially I wanted to kind of go through the history of homelessness. Um, and very soon I just realized that I wanted to kind of change the structure. And so how I organized it was by different pathways that are available for us to be housed. And looking at the data, um, at every point in turn to see, you know, what are the what availability is there for folks to be housed, and so I kind of looked at public housing, um, and and the data showed that 278 thousand people are waiting list, right, and this is a housing for those who are at the lowest levels of income. Uh, but folks are on this way for years. Um, and then we looked at the shelters, right? Those they are busting at, at its seams. Um, and folks, of course, are complaining about just the livelihood and the quality of life or no quality of life that exists uh, when you are in the shelter. Um, and I really wanted, I took a different approach in this, um, in my storytelling. And part of that was because I think very often, especially as a journalist, you know, if, if you're if your editor or, um, or your supervising producer is like, hey, tell a story on homelessness, right? It's traditional to kind of just say, okay, let me find somebody who's kind of going through this and tell their story and get folks to connect. But what I didn't see or what I didn't find was, what if people want to be engaged? What if people want to help but don't understand where to go? Or what, what, if, what are the entry points? And so for me, that, that kind of remained as my personal goal when I was putting the story together. And Norman, who's featured in the documentary, I think very eloquently um, gave a lot of that historical context, because we're hearing and seeing the headlines, but we're not really understanding that this problem has been here for decades. And it's just being exasperated by you know all of the new things that are happening today. And so um, I'm, really, I'm really looking forward to the documentary kind of entering spaces where folks are not familiar with the housing jargon or not familiar with kind of what's out there and available for, for people to be engaged. Um, we also looked at affordable housing and how the housing lottery system um, is really not designed for folks at the lowest, um, who are earning the lowest levels of income. Uh, of course, there's AMI, which is the um, average median income and the area median income, which is kind of skewed, and it, there are some flaws within that um, within within that uh, processing system to use to allocate housing for folks who are applying. And so, the research that I found was that 
even though AMI is tended to provide housing for low income people, it's not those at the lowest income, right? So it's kind of, it's misleading. And I think that sometimes, especially folks who find themselves unhoused, they don't understand why, right? And I think for me, with the doc, I, I really was hoping that we can show the infrastructural problems that exist within the systems. And to also show that is, is closely aligned to race and how the numbers don't lie, right? 88% of the people in shelters are black and brown. And so as a journalist, it's, it's my job, I think, to, to help amplify these stories, but also to hoping to educate the public on um, the different levels of complexities that, that, that exist at all points of society. So that's my answer. Ideally, when you talk about the doc and you want it to get it out there, ideally, where would you want the documentary to be seen? And would you want to have that as a uh, beginning of a group discussion or community discussion, community board? Would they have events there? Why don't you tell us? No, definitely. Um, and this is this is a prime example of of spaces that I hope to kind of spread the word. Um, and and I, I feel like the more that folks are kind of this, I, I look at the documentary as a tool, right? There are folks who want to get engaged, who may not know where to go, know where to start. And I think it's important for, um, especially people a part of marginalized communities, right? So going into the community to share and screen the film is definitely on in the plans of Brick. We do what we call impact events, um, and we're hoping to screen them at different um, to in different spaces, and hoping that folks will come out and get engaged. And of course. Asking them to volunteer with SHAP has been something that I've been, like folks have reached out to me and asked like how can they get engaged? And I've you know graciously shared that information, like touch base with Norman. And I think that we're all trying at our own, um, in our own capacities. And I, I hope that the doc will be another tool that we can use to help educate the community. So if people in the audience want to go home tonight and watch the doc, how do they get, get access to it? So you're going to go to YouTube and you're going to type in Broke Unhousing. So that's Broke, B-R-O-K-E, and Unhousing. And it's um, on Brick TV's channel. Okay, great. So, Sherman, uh, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and tell them about your background. And then, if you can, I know it's painful, tell them what happened. Sure thing, Norm. Um, is this loud enough for everyone to hear? Since uh, there was some concern before, can you hear me well enough? Okay. Um, yeah, the name is Sherman. Last name is Jackson. And um, uh, one correction as to something that Norman said about me: I've never worked for the Daily News. I was the first Hispanic reporter on NBC News. I was in broadcast journalism, and. <laughs> um, had a classmate by the name of Geraldo Rivera. Uh, that was back in 1970 when I started in the news business and progressed. From NBC, I went to what was WNEW, which is now Fox, Channel 5. I've had uh, the opportunity to work uh, in the Nixon administration for a cabinet committee. I've, as Norman said, I mean, without dwelling on all those various jobs, uh, I first came to the Upper West Side uh, as far back as 1959, a uh, single mom and uh, with a kid sister. And we first lived in an SRO at, uh, uh, on 71st Street, Hargrave. And uh, you know, from there, I went to uh, junior high school on 77th Street. Um, we moved uptown. I met my future wife at 17, married her when I was 19. <laughs> I attended college in Puerto Rico for two years, and then when I came back to the city, um, I was working, going to school at night, when um, a group known as the Young Lords Party, sort of Puerto Rican version of the Black Panthers, occupied a church in Spanish Harlem. Geraldo came, represented them as their attorney. I was in that church as well. And um, opportunities arose, and people noticed Geraldo, they noticed me. I was offered 
uh, the opportunity to uh, interview for a fellowship at Columbia. I was fortunate enough, and I attended Columbia University School of Journalism and was sponsored and worked at NBC News. In any case, I've had all these highfalutin jobs. Fast forward to 2008. Um, I lived on West 84th Street between Central Park and Columbus Avenue. My mom, since the 60s, had lived here on the Upper West Side. She lived on 71st Street and Columbus Avenue. I have my sister, who'd been with Cheers and American Express for over 20 years, lost that job, lost her apartment because of someone she met and became involved with, and she became a crack addict. My mom took her in. Uh, in 2008, mom died and had no insurance. And after over 20 years on the Upper West Side, I took a buyout for that studio that I'd occupied all those years, gave my sister my furniture, opened a bank account for her, went to Florida, where things didn't pan out with my son because I was a captive babysitter and cook, and I, I just wasn't going to find work. I returned to New York, but now I don't have a place to live. So I appealed to my sister to allow me to stay in the apartment that I'd arranged for her to inherit. I had contacted MFY Legal Services, claiming that she'd been my mom's caregiver, so she inherited the lease. In short order, um, I realized how much my sister had deteriorated. Uh, she couldn't find undergarments. She called 911, said I'd stolen them and given them to someone, and just constant insanity like that. And, you know, I was a nervous wreck, never knowing, you know, what she was going to do next. And it came to the point where she assaulted me, and it was a severe wound right below my eye. And um, naively, I went to the 20th Precinct thinking that their domestic violence unit could somehow intercede and, um, you know, try to calm things down. And contrary to what I assumed, I was told that they were obligated to arrest her because, because it was a severe wound and it was a case of domestic violence. And I, you know, though I protested, they arrested her. Subsequently, we wound up in family court. Uh, I was issued an order of protection, but of course, I couldn't return to the apartment. The lease was in my sister's name. I have an order of protection against my sister. My son was in Florida, another in Arizona, and I had no place to go. So with a couple of thousand dollars, I went from motel to motel until I ran out of money and I wound up at the uh, 30th Street Men's Shelter. Um, that was not a pleasant experience. Um, at the uh, 30th Street Shelter, I had a room by myself on the second floor uh, for about a week and subsequently they sent me up to what I'd been told was notorious seventh floor. And sure enough, um, within the first 30 minutes, my telephone disappeared. My phone was stolen. I had my social security card, all of my identification, everything, my driver's license, et cetera, in that wallet. So you might just guess the difficulty in trying to recover those documents and trying to you know, get back an identity of sorts. Uh, then came the day uh, that we were told to leave early. Callahan, is it? To the, that there was going to be an inspection and suddenly all the linen was changed to clean linen, et cetera, and we were told to leave. And when I returned, I see that someone had been in my bed and I inquire of one of the workers, and they said, well, it's no longer your bed. You're out of here. You know, you're going to such and such. And I didn't know where the hell such and such was. It turned out it was in downtown Brooklyn. But I was required to take <laughs> what clothing I had. And it was like a couple of duffel bags and bag. And I have a uh, peripheral neuropathy, so my balance really stinks. But they wanted me to take all of that stuff by subway 
you know, and find this place where I had no idea, you know, how to find. And I put up a fight, and by 10 that evening, they put me on a bus with three other people. Two were dropped off at uh, Ward's Island. Uh, another two, uh, another one was dropped off at a shelter on Brooklyn Queens border. And I arrived at a shelter on Prince Street in downtown Brooklyn uh, at almost three o'clock in the morning. Uh, where I'm interviewed, I'm processed, I'm taken upstairs to a dormitory. There were 27 beds in that particular dorm. There was an additional dorm down the hall that housed about another 20, and a separate one that housed about 12 men. Uh, uh, another dorm, as you entered, uh, one would have to, uh, after going through security and a scanner and getting wanded and everything else, there were three steps, albeit they had an elevator there, and down that corridor was still another dormitory for disabled people. And uh, that became a serious issue. Um, I happened to go out just about every day looking for an apartment. I, I'm loath to say it, but it's true. The preponderance of the other guys who were in that shelter with me were not doing the same thing. And uh, one of the requirements that the city has is that you set aside a certain amount of money every month because even if one qualifies for a city voucher, a housing voucher, the landlord may not get that money right away, so we are required to have enough for a down payment for the first month's rent and a security deposit. And since all I was earning at the time was my social security check, you know, that was going to be difficult. So I just decided to improvise. <laughs> I created a GoFundMe for me, uh, you know, which the counselors there were sort of amused about. They'd never seen anything like that. Uh, but I went out and I found a really terrific apartment in Staten Island. I did that on my own. And uh, I convinced the homeowner, his private house, to accept this voucher that I was told that I would qualify for. Uh, I, I didn't qualify for the general vouchers that were being disseminated to everyone else, but there was something new whereby the city would pay an entire year's rent in one lump sum to a landlord, and thereafter you were on your own. And I'd said at the time that I was willing to take a job, even uh, stocking shelves at Walgreens or you know, whatever it took that I was going to be able to sustain myself. But I wanted that one voucher so that I could get this home. And it was a beautiful uh, apartment. It turned out that that voucher required that whatever rent was required of, of me to pay couldn't be more than half of what my income was. Well, it turned out that it was $100 more than half of my income. So as a result, I was denied that voucher. And yet, and yet <laughs> they, the city was willing to pay $5,000 a month to keep me warehoused in this damn uh, shelter out in Brooklyn, as opposed to allowing me a $100 difference a month, you know, which was ridiculous. Uh, as a former newsman, and you know, I've done PR and got to know many, many reporters and editors in the city. I was following a series written by uh, Greg Smith, who was with the Daily News at the time, and I decided to uh, email him because he was doing a series on homeless shelters. It took a couple of weeks, but Greg got back in touch with me. We had coffee. What the hell are you doing here, Sherman? Everyone I know knows you. And I explained, you know, the circumstances. Within a short time, he wrote a two-page spread about me and with a front-page banner in the Daily News. Suddenly, de Blasio's office calls me, uh, <laughs> Cory Booker's office calls me, um, um, Donis Rodriguez, who's DOT commissioner, and who I'd met, uh, I'd been with Occupy Wall Street, and he used to come down to visit us uh, on occasion. And then uh, I got a call from Eric Adams. And since he was walking distance from the shelter, you know, I decided to go and meet the man. And 
Uh, we sat in his conference room for about an hour. He thanked me for my previous service to the city and said he'd heard some things about me and once again had me repeat my story, at which point he stood up and said, come with me, and turned and said, I'm going to run for mayor, <laughs> and I want you to be part of my team. And he took me into the communications office and said, this is your desk, this is your computer, you come here, do whatever it is that you like, and then we can talk about salary. Uh, I forgot to say, he asked me at one point, what do you do during the day? And I explained, when, when I'm not looking for an apartment, I read. <laughs> I'll go to Barnes & Noble, if the weather's good, I go to the promenade, you know, I'll go to a park bench and I read, because you can't return to the shelter, and who would want to anyway, right? So he said to me, you come here, you can sit and read, do whatever it is you want, and within short order, um, when I returned to the shelter, and this is significant because not everybody in, in the homeless system knows Norman Siegel, <laughs> and I had that, that good fortune. Um, and as it turned out, uh, among the people that called me that first day of the publication of the story, was someone from DHS, the Department of Homeless Services. And I was told that this person wanted to see me. I didn't have a clue who she was. And I opted to wait two days before agreeing to go. But at the last moment, I said to them, yeah, let them know I'm going, but I'm going with counsel. And Norman <laughs> met me there. Suddenly, it turned out that it was the head administrator of the Department of Homeless Services. And upon their learning that I was bringing an attorney with me, had her whole cabinet there practically. Uh, and suddenly I am handed a citywide uh, uh, housing application. And I said, you know, I've been here 11 months now. Why? But that's how it turned out. And uh, ultimately, I was issued a Section 8. I was sent to what is, by most standards, a luxury building in downtown Brooklyn. Um, I, it's a studio. When uh, Greg found out about it, um, you know, he asked me to let him know, and he wrote another story with me holding my keys in front of my uh, apartment door at the time. Um, so I, I remained with, uh, with Eric Adams, and um, now I'm with him that he's mayor as well. So um, I've just been very, very fortunate. Uh, w w a couple of things quickly. Something that is not often discussed is most of the guys that were in that shelter with me were straight out of prison. They were out of Rikers. They were out of state prison. And that's not often discussed. But there is this prison to shelter pipeline and two men were murdered in my shelter. One while I was there, and he happened to be the only Caucasian man in, in the joint. He'd gotten an apartment, he'd gotten a voucher. And when I asked him, why are you still here? He said, you know, that he had, uh, uh, what, what's the uh, syndrome? Help me, uh, from World War II, the, uh, Yes, he, he had become so accustomed to being in that environment in the shelter that he was afraid to leave it. And uh, two weeks after having received his voucher and an apartment, he was murdered. He, he was beaten up and, and he died. A week after I left the shelter, I was in the car with Eric Adams to, uh, on the way to a press conference when I got a call from the same reporter asking me if I knew a particular individual yeah, I did. He was in my dormitory. He was like mid to late 60s. He was killed by a young guy straight out of Rikers. Okay? And th that was the issue. The older guys who would come out of state prison were a little bit more stable or at least, you know, restrained. The young guys coming out of Rikers were serious trouble. Were serious trouble. So um, I, I've been blessed. I've been blessed uh, and I'm uh, deeply grateful. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me very quickly uh, make some recommendations. And also, Shaft produced an annual report. Uh, 
I think it's pretty good. And if anybody would like a copy, uh, my uh, email address is nsegel at s-t-e-l-l-p dot com, and I'll send you a copy of the report. Uh, we made a half a dozen specific recommendations, and then we'll open up for comments. First, if individuals were provided with viable options, a voluntary will leave the streets. That was proven correct. Second, viable options, especially single rooms, do not exist in adequate numbers. If the city intends to reduce the street homeless population, more options such as temporary housing, mental health, substance abuse, job training programs, especially single rooms, must be created expeditiously. Three, the Congress shelter has failed for most of the street homeless. Like Sherman said, many left the congregate shelters because they were beaten, threatened, and were victims of theft of property, including identification documents, such as social security cards. Four, although many DA workers and Adams administration officials are compassionate and caring, the system in place at the Joint Command Center, which is part of the Department of Homeless Services, needs to be reviewed with the goal of improving efficiency. So we gave an example. If we identified a person experiencing homelessness who wants to leave the streets or parks voluntarily, it takes an inordinate amount of time to place the individual and to provide transportation to that location. Otherwise, as happens too often, that person changes his or her mind after leaving due to the length of time it takes to provide the placement. Uh, we've asked for them, and we accomplished in one of our locations, since they know we're going to be there every Thursday night, 7 to 9, why don't you place the van there at 5 to 7 so that when we're finished by 8.45, we can put four or five people on the van and you could take them to the various places. But only in one location so far that they agree to do that. If the goal is to get people off the streets, that's one of the ways to get them off the streets. Uh, many of the people experiencing homelessness have mental health problems, but they're not a danger to themselves or others. These individuals need and should be provided with mental health community-based voluntary placements where behavior therapy approaches can be utilized. You don't have to shoot people up with Haldol all the time. You don't have to send them to Bellevue or other places and then send them out five to seven days later in a revolving door after you shoot them up with their medication because once they get out on the streets, they're going to have the same problems. There's other ways to deal with it. Uh, we were disappointed with some of the city government officials who, when presented with specific recommendations, did not take the recommendations seriously. I'll give you one example. Uh, when we a green light by the mayor to proceed with a report recommending that the city or state utilize eminent domain procedures to jointly condemn and seize, vacant and utilize, underutilize hotels to ameliorate the public crisis of homelessness, senior Ad Matt Adams administration officials refused to consider the report and recommendations seriously. After waiting five months for a meeting, Bob and I were finally given a one-hour meeting where our recommendations to use eminent domain since there's so many vacant hotels in the city, and those hotels are ideal. They're single rooms with a company, a private bathroom. So you can really get people to come off the streets. We were told that this is not a good idea because it would purportedly cost too much and take too long. They keep sending people to hotels, spending anywhere from $175 to $300 plus each night to deal with this problem. Uh, Koch did it. Every mayor's done it. It's a short-term solution. They figure they get them off the street, out of sight, out of mind. Forget the budget consequences and forget the fact that that's not a permanent solution. So why are we doing it over and over again, and we're doing it again now, especially with the migrants. So 
uh, that report on eminent domain, if when it was presented in December of 2022, if they took this and suggested the state use their funds to purchase the hotels and then give the management uh, uh, contract to the city where the city could do it on its own or have not-for-profits run those hotels and provide support services for people, perhaps we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in today. And finally, the revolving door. It's not just when they send them to the psych hospitals and they're out within five to seven days, but what I talked about before, where we find people, persuade them to leave the streets, and then sometimes the next day we get a phone call. Sometimes it's a week where the person says, I couldn't take it anymore. Uh, the place is just not adequate. It's shocking, but they say to me, I feel safer being out on the street. I feel greater freedom. I don't have the kind of restrictions that the shelter that you sent me to or the program that you sent me to and they're hostile, they make judgments about me because of my past, and again, uh, unless there's a total revamping of how to deal, at least with street homeless people, we're gonna have at least four to 5,000 street homeless people, and plus, if they restrict, even eliminate the right to shelter that Bob created, uh, we will look like L.A., San Francisco, and other cities where people are just out on the streets putting up tents. None of us want that. There's a common ground here. The homeless don't want to be out on the street. We, the advocates, don't want them to be out on the street. The city claims, the state claims they don't want them out on the street. If you have all that common ground, develop a program that's serious, that's effective to ameliorate the problem. And that's where we all come in. We need some of you, if not all of you, to think about volunteering. Uh, we have a group in Harlem. We have a group at Midtown. We don't have anything on the Upper West Side. And knowing the history of the Upper West Side, there's a gap here. Uh, and uh, we would hope all we need is a team of about six people we give you a team leader, we train you, and we want six because everyone can't come every Thursday night. So if we have at least three or four with a team leader, we can do it every Thursday night, seven to nine. If the team wanted to do it on another night or another day or the weekend, we're flexible to do that. But it's good to do it uniformly so that we're all doing it at the same time. Okay, so uh, we ran a little over an hour, not much. Uh, we're going to open the floor. Uh, is there any mics on the floor for people to speak? That's great. Thank you, Ed. Uh, don't disappoint us. This is not a crowd that's shy. This is not a group that doesn't have something to say. So, all right. The floor is open. Hi, I'm Rachel, I'm Rachel Bierman. I'm Norman's stepdaughter, and this is my mom. Um, so I just wanted to share my experience working with SHAP because it's so much more than you can ever imagine. It's one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had. Um, first of all, I graduated from public policy at NYU, and I learned all about Bob Hayes, and he's a star. I mean, what he did in New York was so important because if you don't have right to shelter, most people don't realize New York is the only state that has right to shelter. I think Massachusetts has, I know, okay. All right, the end, no. But it's the most powerful thing because like Norman said, people, if we don't have right to shelter, people wind up in the streets. That means families wind up in the streets, children wind up in the streets. And so he saved a lot, a lot of people, not just put a roof over their head, but just save their lives. If you know what's happening around the country, a lot of women, single moms, live in their cars with their kids because they're afraid 
if they don't have a home, then this, you know, the, the kids will wind up in foster care. Homeless, people experiencing homelessness, like you look at Sherman, you just can't imagine somebody like Sherman being homeless, but there are a lot of Shermans, and there are a lot of really horrible little things that happen in people's lives, and they wind up on the streets. And it is unfair, it's shocking, it's, you know, it's, it's almost unimaginable. I mean, it's just really unimaginable. And going out week after week, and you know, the only time in this whole year and a half that Norman has ever missed going out on a Thursday night was when he had COVID. I mean, he is so committed to it because it does make you feel good, but it makes you feel good because when you really connect with people, you realize like you just happen to be lucky to be born who you were, you know, who you're born into, you know, the, the family you were born into. People are very vulnerable on the streets and they're scared. And when you've been on the streets for a really, really, really long time, you have to be treated gently. And the, one of the biggest problems with um, the government is that they've become numb to this situation and they do get aggressive with people. And it is just so hard, you know, to watch that. And, you know, going out week after week, you establish relationships with people and it is such an incredibly uplifting experience. I know it doesn't sound uplifting when you think of going into the streets and helping somebody, you know, go into a, a, a safe haven, but it's truly like connecting with someone, just another human being. It's so important. It's, I'm, I'm just advocating that you guys all, if you haven't done it, just give it a shot. It's amazing. It's an amazing, what you guys have done is, Unbelievable. I am so honored to be part of this. So I hope every one of you gets Norman's email and emails us and, and becomes you know, part of this really incredible advocacy project. So that's it. Thank you, Rachel. Good evening. Just Good evening. Introduce yourself. My name is Doc Lionel Lamage, but my friends call me Doc. So I'm the guy you guys have been talking about. There's nothing like the power of now. Right now, I'm on the streets. I live on the streets. I'm not homeless. I'm houseless. The earth is my home. These two wonderful people have taken me in. They let me sleep on their couch up until their grandchildren came. They live in a one-bedroom apartment on the Upper West Side, okay? Yesterday, I took a shower, thanks to them, their facilities, okay? I've lived in their car. I have a voucher. I have a Section 8 voucher for six months. I'm running around. They give me the run around, the run around, the run around. Most, most, most entities, what they do is they ask you for all your information. And as soon as they get the information, you're cut off. I had to go downtown to get an extension for my Section 8 voucher, right? It's like it's a scam out there. The scams, they, they copy, they, they say, send me the voucher. We're going to help you. And as soon as you send it, they use it for something else. I don't know how they do it, but they, they finagled it. It's like three-card Monty, you know, the system. It, you're going to lose. Here I am, man. I, you know, I'm, you're talking about pressure. You're talking about hardship. You're talking about all that stuff. I've experienced shelter of Bellevue, Wards Island, BRC, yeah, I was sleeping on the west side not too long ago on Broadway, and I was waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning by BRC. And they did the whole transfer thing and brought me to this place. I stayed there for a week. And then one day at 11.30 p.m., I got your treatment. Take all your stuff and go here. Now, where is this? You know? And I have to find it for myself. I get there, and they don't have any beds. So now I'm si I sleep on the floor from... 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. At 8 a.m., I'm told, okay, um, leave, but come back. Tonight, we might have a bed for you. You know, like, this is ridiculous. It's so ridiculous, man. So, like I said, I'm here. I have a phone. I have my email. Um, after, If anybody can point me in the right direction, God in Riverside, I went there. They got my info, but never heard from them again. It's a whole bunch of it. I didn't want to throw that up, but anyway, yeah. 
So, you know, at the end, if anybody has some kind of information that they can help me with, I, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for that testimony. Your voice is strong, and people with lived experience make the best outreach volunteers, and your compassion is radiant, so thank you for saying that story. I just want to compliment SHAP as well and the work that they do. I do have a question, but uh, the way you build companionship and friendship alongside of trying to get people into shelter, I actually think some of the most important work you do is the friendships that you build because in the end, even if that revolving door happens or you get a no, you build a friendship and in time, that will capitalize into big movements. Uh, so when the system fails, friendship will carry you through. So uh, I also think what you're doing is building an amazing companionship model. In the cities that I go around and study homelessness, companionship models are the one thing that our consistent data shows with low barrier clients reducing homelessness. So what you do within companionship is really life changing. My question is, you've done now SHAP for a year. Where does your hopes and dreams for SHAP in the next year, Norman, and where do you hope to kind of see it go? Thanks. We want to expand so that for the first year, we're in six different locations in the Bronx and Manhattan. Uh, it's five boroughs. It's not two boroughs. Uh, the two boroughs we did was where the majority of the homeless people we thought were, but now there's homeless people in every borough. So uh, we want to be successful with CUNY on a pilot. Uh, and uh, in the CUNY program, we did the training at Brooklyn College. And this Thursday night will be the first time we'll have a team regularly committed every Thursday night. And they're going to start out on Flappish Avenue near the college. Uh, and if the pilot works, uh, CUNY has said that they'd be willing to give us access to all their campuses. Uh, we also have reached out to Fordham in the Bronx. We're doing another training at the Teachers College at Columbia. We did one in March at NYU. Uh, we think that students are ideal for this kind of a project, but it's not exclusive just for students. Uh, at Hostess, uh, the organizer called me and said, we're gonna do a training on October 24th, but the words got out on our campus and we wanna know whether some of the faculty members and one dean wanted to know could they participate in the program. And we said, that's terrific in addition to having age diversity, the idea that students and faculty would be working together on a social justice program will bring benefits in and of itself to the college. Uh, so the answer to the question is, uh, a year from now, the dream would be that we're in maybe 20 different locations and that last year we had 46 volunteers, that maybe in a year from now we have 100 volunteers uh, and that we're able not only to do the companionship that you talked about, but the other aspect is not only to advocate for the people out on the streets, but to begin to advocate to the government, the city and the state, to get them to change their policies and practices. You know, for example, in, in shelters, give an example, if we find someone out on the street, they only can have two bags. They have three bags, they won't take them in. Uh, find the location where the third bag can be warehoused. I mean, the idea is not to create barriers for people who want to come off the street. We should help them, not create more problems for them. Second, they have a thing in a lot of the shelters where, in fact, you can't bring food into the shelter. So what about people who have medication? Uh, I take medication. Sometimes I have to take the medication with food. So if I can't bring food into the shelter, I can't take my medication, they're not coming in. Uh, and I can go on and on about some of the, I call them 
Brooklyn term, cockamamie rules that they tell us, and we're trying to get them to rethink some of their practices, their attitudes, and their policies. Don't get me wrong, there are good people in some of these agencies, but overall, uh, they should have everyone in these agencies caring about the people. And I understand what you're saying. You give, I understand what you're saying. You give them the information, and then they don't want to do anything. We have people out on the street who have vouchers, and there's no one in the city that we can rely on to help people who have a voucher know where to go. And I've said over and over again, if they have vouchers and they go to places that the city will have a list and the people refuse them because they're homeless, we'll sue them within a week and because it's illegal. And I see commercials from the Human Rights Commissioner saying exactly that. So why aren't we suing some of the owners of these buildings if they're not validating and accepting the vouchers? And if it turns out that the city is not paying people like they're supposed to, then we should sue the city to get them to do it. So it is a mess, but it's something that I think collectively, if we have lots of people in the city doing this kind of work, we have a network citywide, it's harder for the people in government to turn us down. We have room for just, time for just one more question. We're going to nine o'clock. Yeah, but you usually had some discussion afterwards, so. Use your mic, use your mic. HPD and you tell them that you have a Section 8, HPD will give you a citywide application where you can select various buildings where you can apply that Section 8. Okay. Uh, Hi, good evening. Um, so I know there's probably several questions. I want to make mine as brief as possible. Um, I am an attorney. I don't deal directly in, in homelessness. Deal some with real estate, um, only a little bit landlord tenant, uh, some probate as well. In New York, and I imagine a whole bunch of other jurisdictions, when someone passes away, even if they have no will, the next of kin have to be notified. If they have a will, the next of kin have to be notified. If they're unmarried and with no children, the next of kin have to be notified. So the state, the law forces um, the family to get involved when someone passes away, at least for the sake of being notified. The state, the law obviously has um, legal obligations for parents of minors. They're legally obligated to provide for their minors. For a spouse to receive Medicaid services, if they're married, the other spouse either has to contribute or has to say that they refuse to contribute, but they have to say something. So my question, and this is for everybody up there, you all alluded to at some point or another family when you talked about you know, the different stories and work that you have done, whether it was a spouse, whether it was a sister, whether it was a son, um, and you know, kind of a side point, people are forming families um, more seldomly today than they might have you know, decades ago, less people getting married, less people having children, so on and so forth. So the question is, um, from your experience, how does the next of kin, if you will, or the family um, get, I don't wanna say involved, but what role have you seen them play when someone is homeless and without immediate family support? Are there traditionally efforts to find who is a close family member or a, a family member that can at least be notified, if not participate in helping to make sure that that individual gets some assistance? I mean, the, the, it's a great question, uh, and it's without a simple answer. Um, one of the things that some of these lawyers will point out probably more, more knowledgeably than I is the privacy issue. Very often when someone winds up being homeless, there's a degree of estrangement uh, from family and there's no way that a city welfare organization, a city shelter system can without the consent 
of the um, client reach out to people. Um, you know, I'm not going to go back to Daniel Patrick Moynihan or some of the Republican folks these days talking about the you know, fractured family being the cause of all problems, but it's very, very uncommon for there to be a very strong, intact, helpful family for single homeless folks. We're obviously talking about a whole different world with homeless families themselves, but even there, the degree of estrangement is um, sad and tough to deal with. My experience, and I'll give you one or two examples, is when I've approached the homeless person and asked and found out that he had a family, uh, do I have permission to call? And a few times, the person says, do not. Uh, I have one example, it's a really unbelievable story. There was a guy, 60 some odd years, a white guy, homeless at the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. Uh, I talked to him, uh, want to know where he grew up. He grew up four blocks from where I grew up. So that became a factor that I could build upon to try to continue the conversation. Turned out, he claimed, he was a cop for 22 years. Uh, now, prior to that, he kept saying when I said, you know, you need a sandwich, you want to get a soda or anything, and he said, no, nah, I got plenty of money. So it could turn out that maybe he was a cop and maybe he had his pension. Uh, that's because maybe that's why he had money. I then found out when we talked about things like playing punch ball, stick ball on the streets, he started to have tears in his eyes. I said, what do you, what's the tears for? And he said, I haven't had this kind of conversation, and my life was so good back then, but now it's all negative. He had two sons. One was working for the fire department of the city of New York, and one was in the military. So I said, let me get in touch with them. No, don't get in touch with them. I said, why not? I don't want them to think their dad's a loser. I said, sir, you're not a loser. We're gonna get you a place, and you're so articulate and caring, I want you to eventually, when you get back on your feet, become one of our volunteers. So we shook hands on it, I gave him my card, we found him a place in the Bronx, I never heard from him again. Uh, he didn't have a cell phone, so I couldn't call him. And he was one of the people that I feel we failed because uh, if he, the story he was telling me was true, uh, we could have we got him back on his feet. We've had people who don't want anyone in their family to know because they feel embarrassed, shamed. And we tried to explain there's more than, I would say a few have actually said to me, you know, I'm a loser. And we have to then, we're not psychologists or anything, but we have to, we know as human beings to immediately tell them, you're not a loser. Don't think that way. Right. And we try to keep working with them. And we've got these three guys. There's a guy named Charlie down at the Staten Island Ferry. He's been there for 10 weeks. Every Thursday night, Charlie is there. I talk with him. I still can't get him to come off the streets. He's a survivor. He knows exactly how to survive for food, clothing. He rides the subways. He doesn't want to sleep in the park. And he knows which trains to go on between midnight and six in the morning because he knows that he's safe on those particular trains. So I've learned that a lot of those folks out there on the street, they are survivors. On the other hand, you know, I don't know why Charlie won't come off the streets, especially when we're able to get him something, but I don't make the judgment about him because if I start making judgments about him, we lose the capacity of eventually getting him to want to come off the streets. I don't know if that responds to your question, but that's where it is. Anyone else want to add anything? Yeah, I just wanted to add um, that I think a lot of folks don't realize that 
all of us, I mean, a lot of us can be one situation away from being unhoused. And I think that just hearing that resonates with me because sometimes we're fortunate or sometimes we're looking at other people's situations and not realizing that, you know, it could be us too. And the other thing I wanted to note is that 50% of New York City or 50% of people who live here can't afford to. So again, I think just amplify, further amplifying this idea that folks are embarrassed or ashamed, I think just hearing that is enough to understand that it can literally be any of us. Can, can we give this gentleman, sir, sir, can we give this gentleman who has the hand up from the get-go, we're all about equity here and fairness and this guy's gonna wanna tear me apart. So let's, let's give him a chance. Well, uh, I'm not going to tear you apart. The first thing I want to say, I remember the day in 1979 exactly when the Callahan lawsuit came in to the office. And I remember a young Bob Hayes. He's a little older right now. First time that we met. Uh, the litigation, the consent decree, uh, all these things as if they happened yesterday. And uh, I'm not going to spend an hour, but I think there's some things I can share with you that you may find interesting. Um, this is not a legal audience, so a lot of the things that lawyers would find interesting, you know, you might say, well, what about these individual stories that are so heart-rending? And I'm not an expert in them, and I'm a human being like you, and I react like you. And when I got to know a little bit about homelessness, uh, as a lawyer, I went to see some of the places that we were litigating about at night. I went to the Bowery Hotels, as we called them, and I saw the eight by eight foot chicken wire enclosures that were some of the places that at that time in 79 and 80 housed some people. I went to the Keener building that we built on Ward Island. I went to other places. You have to see things with your own eyes as a human being to have a feeling of what the thousands of hours of legal work that you're talking about are. I also, I just wanna stop and say that I have nothing but the highest regard for Bob and for Norman. I have known them for years, and Norman especially, when he was head of the Civil Liberties Union, we have litigated on the opposite sides of many big cases involving civil liberties, First Amendment, AIDS, everything that you can imagine. And there is nothing greater as a lawyer than to be against the best and highest quality lawyers on the other side. And in all the years, Norman, that we have been that way, that is why our relationship now is as good as it is. And I, why, I, why I'm here today, when I saw this notice, I, I, I knew I had to be here, and I'm so glad that I am. I wanna give you a couple of things from that first year. Um, I know here, for legal purposes, we say that <clears throat> the case created the right to shelter. The issues, Bob's absolutely correct, there was a preliminary injunction there, and that's, an, that's a preliminary step in a lawsuit. But the, that doesn't necessarily mean that there will be a permanent injunction. It's, it's like a holding step, and let's see if there are more issues to be resolved. That case was ultimately resolved by a consent decree. A consent decree means that the city agreed to certain terms, and that is what the Callahan decision is going forward for years and years. In those years, uh, and I was in charge of litigation for the city then, and, and lots of other issues that I was dealing with. We tried as much as possible to see if we can reach agreement with people who were suing the city. But reaching an agreement with a consent decree means that you give up the rights of citizens to have the people that they elected make basic decisions, and instead you have a judge who oversees a court injunction who whenever there's an issue of how many beds should you have, how often should people shower, Instead of a commissioner deciding it, you wind up going to a judge. And then you wonder, hmm, in a democracy, is that the best way to resolve large social issues? Some people say yes, some people say no. I happen to sign the consent decree called the Aspira de Consent Decree that established the kind of education that Spanish-speaking children in New York were to get, this is in the 1970s, that has governed the system since then. Now, we could have challenged that. And I spoke once to the judge, and I know that if we had, 
he would not have probably judged my, half as much as what we agreed to. So the spirit consent decree became a very important uh, guideline for the women's case, for the men's case, because as Bob said, logically one led to the other. And the other thing that I want you just to think about, you know, I graduated from Columbia Law School. Most of my friends went to Wall Street law firms. I was one of the outliers. And I said, well, I don't know. I, I'm always interested in public interest stuff. Public interest could mean one of two things, either doing what Norman or Bob is doing or doing what I did. Both sides are public interest lawyers. So what is it that somebody who represents you as a citizen, not as an advocate, but as a citizen doing for the city? Well, I can tell you this, that at the same time as we were litigating these extremely complicated and difficult and, and important homeless cases, in the next courtroom in the federal courthouse, I can tell you that I was supervising lawyers who were litigating a, a class action on the rights of people in jails. 20, 30,000 people represented by another civil rights group who felt that they were not getting their rights. So that was a five, six year litigation. And then in the next courtroom, we were litigating the case on school financing. The people who felt that the one million students were not getting proper uh, financing in certain areas because of real estate taxes, et cetera. So that would be another few billion dollars. And then we had the Spanish homeless speaking and I was litigating a case on the rights of women who work for the city who wanted greater pension rights. That's only 200,000 people and it was only four or five billion dollars. So you put together, and when you as a lawyer win a case, the law doesn't say you have this right but only as long as it costs so money for the city. Bob knew that, Norman knows that. So when you bring an individual case or a case of a lot of people, you say there is no money here, it's a, it's a right. You can't put money as an issue and if you seem to do so, you seem heartless. Well, you're a citizen, you pay taxes. Uh, you see what happens right now when we unexpectedly have 100,000 asylum migrants in the city. Could anybody, Bob, have dreamed when we were talking about the consent decree? And how many homeless people a night did we have? 800, we went up to 2,000. I remember when we hit 2,000, that was considered unthinkable. And today it's 200,000. So In fairness, Mr. Gopstein, <laughs> <laughs> um, we sort of anticipated emergency situations. There's an appendix to the consent decree. Yes. Yes, There's an appendix to the consent decree that talks about how to deal with emergencies. Um, can I ask the audience a question? Because sure. um, we've been doing too much talking up here, I fear. Um, the right to shelter, as Doran says, you know, legal, you know, kind of top down, pulling democracy away maybe a little bit from the elected officials, um, but that's what court orders do. I have been th reflecting lately, because obviously there's some threat to the court order by their friend, Mayor Adams, um, there's some threat to that. I have a feeling, not just on the Upper West Side, but over these decades, we've changed the New York ethos to believe that the right thing to do is the right to shelter. Am I right? Do we feel that way, that the right to shelter, court or not, is the morally, politically right thing to do? Just by a show of hands, how many people would agree with what Bob said? All right, there, that's you. So we're gonna go to Staten Island tonight and <laughs> try that, but I do think that's true, and I do actually in some ways think that, you know, we did a lot of stuff in court, but you know, I was at a lot of churches and synagogues and places those years too. And over time, clergy, political leaders, folks stood up and began talking morals, not just law, so. Uh, I, I've had experience dealing with asylum seekers as, as a, an employee of the city and working for the mayor's office. I, uh, spent time at some of the put, large put the shelters, closer, yeah. at some of the uh, large shelters. I've uh, volunteered at a litigation center uh, set up at the uh, American Red Cross building, uh, assisting a family in filling out their application for uh, a meeting with immigration in order to get asylum. And all I can say, and uh, listen, I've been confronted by Sliwa and his cohorts uh, at 
at a parade in Staten Island where they were attacking us about moving people into Creedmoor, et cetera, et cetera. And all I can say is, sincerely, sincerely, there's a lot of resentment that we hear at the town hall meetings from average New Yorkers who are concerned about benefits going to the newcomers as opposed to resident or indigenous homeless people and others that are waiting for affordable apartments. And it's, pardon me, sir, it's not 100, but now it's reached 125,000, and that continues. We're expecting another 2,000 just this week. So it's exceedingly difficult. I mean, exceedingly difficult. My personal experience with Eric Adams is he has his heart, the, his heart in the right place, and there is compassion, but he also has to handle a budget, and there are services that principally go to the poor or the less, the less able in the city. They're necessarily going to have to be cut back in order for the city to be able to afford to pay for the services being provided to the asylum seekers. All right, there's really time for just one more question. If someone has, yeah, you've been raising your hand, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Yep, definitely. Good evening, everyone. Um, Tadia's mother. <laughs> I am an edgy. <laughs> Thank you. I am a, a New York City Department of, uh, of Education for um, educator for 25 years. Right now, currently serving as the director for special education in Staten Island. I oversee special ed in, for 74 schools there. And what we're seeing and how this impact the educational system at large in the city and uh, some of the issues that we face um, as a result of homelessness or unhousing, uh, unhoused families is issues around attendance, right? And issues around just basic access to day-to-day -day, uh, resources, uh, in terms of the digital platforms that oftentimes teachers are using with students and they have to go home and conduct like homework activities on Wi-Fi and they need to have access to a device and all of the things that affect the fact that they are unhoused. And so I publicly thank all of the stakeholders in, in this process who ensures that some of our students have a place to go after two, three o'clock, and even if they stay in an after school, that they can go to a place where there's lighting, there's probably a working computer, there's probably Wi-Fi access, and there's a warm meal somewhere with a loving um, set of hugs waiting for them, so I publicly thank everyone who's had anything to do with this with this um, piece of, of law, and that on behalf of New York City uh, Department of Education, the children are thankful and grateful for this piece of law. Thank you so much. So let, let us conclude since we're getting close to nine o'clock, and I wanna read you one sentence from the 1979 decision in the Callahan case because it's a point that frustratingly I see not only reporters, I see elected officials, I see government officials miss this point. There is no reason why these homeless and indigent men cannot be lodged and fed at institutions wherever available in the state doesn't say the city, it says the state. And it is incumbent upon those public officials, public officials responsible for caring for the needy to find such lodgings. So when Governor Hochul says that the state is not a party to the Callahan versus Cary, so right to shelter does not expand to the whole of the state. That's her comment. She's wrong. The state should have and can continue to be equally obligated, not just five counties in New York City, but the other 57 counties. We've asked the city, I've asked legal aid to tell the judge 
and read the judge, the sentence that I just read. It says, wherever in the state. And that is a way to deal with this crisis. And if the court ordered the governor to come up with a plan in 30 or 60 days to have locations in all of the 62 counties, that could be the model for the federal government to do the same thing in the other 49 states. So it's complicated, yet in some ways it's elemental. I thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you. Uh, let's thank our panel and thank Norman for uh, bringing us forward on this. So that's really wonderful.